Welcome to a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville with the sermon of Mother Linda Logan for the fourth Sunday of Lent. One holy God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Amen. Raising a poisonous snake up on a pole so people can look at it and be healed, and comparing Jesus' crucifixion to such a sight? It's readings like these that make people give up on the Bible and the church. Many people quote John 3.16, but I wonder how many of them have read that line in context. And part of the context is an incident relayed in the book of Numbers, 
namely the instruction God gives Moses to make a model of a serpent and raise it up for the people to look at and be healed. Let's look at this. The book of Numbers is the result of layers of materials being woven together. That book of the Hebrew Scriptures contains material that may date as far back as 1000 BCE. The Gospel of John also went through stages of development, but only over a couple of decades. It likely dates in its final form to about the year 90. There is a vast gulf of time between the writing of John's Gospel and our time, and an even vaster gulf between the creation of the materials in the Book of Numbers and our time. And what those gulfs of time point to are the gulfs between the cultures which produce these books and the culture in which we live and try to understand what these books are saying to us. So this is to say, yes, the Bible is strange. It has strange material in it. Nonetheless, it is scripture. And that means it has authority for our lives and how we live them. And what God is saying through the book of Numbers has just as much relevance for us as does the Gospel of John. For what the book of Numbers wrestles with is the transition from the old generation to the new. How is faith transferred from one generation to another? How does the story of a generation of the past become the story of a present generation? The Book of Numbers shows us a people who found that the journey from God's promise to fulfillment of that promise led by way of wilderness. And the first half of Numbers, which is the half that today's reading comes from, recounts the death of the generation of people God led out of Egypt. What it tells us is that this generation the generation who had experienced the liberation of the Exodus and the enlightenment of the giving of the law at Sinai, this generation never reached the promised land. Instead, its members died in the wilderness, their deaths being brought about by their continuing rebellion against God. It is one such episode that we have in today's first reading. It is one of many in which the people complain about the liberation that God is giving them. The people have forgotten what it was like to live as slaves in Egypt and they are questioning not just Moses' action in leading them through the wilderness. They are complaining at heart against God and the form that God's deliverance takes. God has sent them quail and manna and water from the rock to say nothing of the devoted, if weary, leadership of Moses. And yet the people complain bitterly. What is so difficult about this passage 
is that it tells us that God has sent poisonous snakes among the people to bite and kill them, and that when Moses intercedes, God tells Moses to make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Now, we have problems with taking this text as scripture. The first is that the action that is attributed to God, that of sending snakes to kill the people, is diametrically opposed to the picture of God revealed in Jesus. The second is that the remedy God sets in motion is magic, the bizarre nature of which runs contrary to the faith which is outlined in the law God gave to Moses. It is serpent magic, as it was practiced in ancient Egypt. And what some scholars think is that it is possibly inserted into the story of Moses at this point to explain something that happened much later during the time of Hezekiah. What we're possibly seeing is a created backstory for a passage in the second book of Kings. Now, the stories told in the book of Numbers and those told in the second book of Kings represent sections of Israel's history some three to six centuries apart. But the books themselves were likely edited for the last time during or after the 6th century BCE exile of the people in Babylon. The passage in 2 Kings tells of King Hezekiah reforming the worship of the people by, among other things, breaking up relics which had come to be treated as idols. And the text says that one of those idols was the bronze serpent that Moses had made. What we're seeing in the book of Numbers in the story of Moses and the model of the serpent is likely the hand of an editor providing a story of origin for a serpent statue that was found in the temple in Jerusalem and destroyed. So, what we have arrived at by considering the conclusions of scholars is the understanding that sympathetic magic is not effected by God. God does not instruct us to worship snakes. And getting this difficulty with the text behind us we can now look at this text and see wherein its authority lies for us as people of God of the 21st century. Its authority lies in the truth it speaks about the liberation God gives us. A liberation that traces its roots from the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the law at Sinai to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God leads us forth from life 
that holds us bound to life that creates life as it creates justice and compassion. But despite God's making us God's people, by calling us forth from systems and practices that enslave us, by providing us with a law or teaching that enlightens us, by living among us as life and love incarnate, we tend to kick at the liberation God gives us. For to live as people free from dehumanizing systems, to live within the teaching of the law and the prophets, to live as incarnations of God's life-giving love, we have to put ourselves out there on the line for others, just as Moses did, just as Jesus did. And we know that Moses didn't make it to the promised land, and that what Jesus made it to was a cross that lifted him up, just like that serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. But that image was supposed to be one of healing. Remember? Moses was to lift up the serpent so that, looking on it, people could be healed and live. And what John's Gospel tells us is that Jesus is lifted up so that those who look to him may have life that is eternal. Life that is eternal is life that is of God. Life that is of God is life that exhibits God's nature. Justice, kindness, and humility. For God's humility is shown in God's continuing to interact with us. The struggle to live life that is of God is the story we are to pass on. That is the faith that we are to transfer to the next generation.
This has been a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville. We're glad you could join us this morning and hope you can again next week.